Hello and welcome to Cinema Savvy and welcome to another episode of the Infinity Saga Retrospective. I'm your host George Aldridge and today we are visiting the fourth film in the MCU, 2011's Thor. Hello everybody and welcome back to Cinema Savvy. It's myself, George, and as mentioned earlier, we are going to be talking the the very first Thor film in the MCU. We're still in phase one in this Infinity Saga retrospective. I'm joined as usual by Christopher Garner and we have another new person to bring to the show tonight. I'm delighted to introduce Charlie, who we have below. Uh, Welcome to the channel for the first time on a video as well. Thanks. Good to be here. Exactly. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I know it's not. I know he's not your favourite Avenger, and that's going to lead me on to the the next question. As everybody gets introduced on the series, we want to know for people at home who is your favourite Avenger. Uh, uh, the, before you say, before you say, oh, I'm going to say <laughs> it's uh, Captain America's currently winning five to one, and I've not given mine away yet. So, uh, can you boost Cap's leads even more? Um, probably not. <laughs> No, my favourite Avenger is Hawkeye. Obviously, because he's the best Avenger. That's that's, 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 <laughs> let, let's get one point on the board for Hawkeye, then. We'll see if it goes up anymore by the end of this retrospective. George, we all know yours is like Howard the Duck. Like, don't don't keep yeah. it. It's going to be this really sad guessing game for the next like two months, and then we're going to hit we're going to hit Spider Man Far From Home. And at this point in time, they have put Tame McGuire in the MCU. And we'll have a Tobey Maguire Spider-Man on the board. Um, I'm pretty however, sure I know who your favourite Avenger is, George. Uh, if you can guess it, I'm not going to confirm or deny it, though. Yeah, I'm not going to guess because I'll just look like an idiot if I'm wrong. <laughs> well, I mean, the thing is, people have got a couple of months inside. Actually, people, while we're talking this, while we are talking the very first Thor film, I want you to comment below at home. Who do you think, A, is my favourite Avenger? That's a bit of a weird one. But also, I want you guys to comment state with your thoughts on the very first Thor film. Uh, this is something we've not spoken about the channel. Everything we've done Marvel has been Age of Ultron onwards. Uh, great timing having the Hawkeye fun on to name drop Age of Ultron, actually. Maybe we'll see you on that Age of Ultron video. We probably will, actually, because that is Hawkeye's yeah. best film. Uh, well, actually, no, it may be Endgame. Um, that being said, we're not here to discuss Phase 2 or 3. We're back on Phase 1. Before we get into the meat of it, as usual, we're going to round off our socials where you guys can find us. So we've got Facebook, Cinema Savvy, Twitter at cinema underscore savvy, letterbox.com slash cinema savvy, and we have a link to our T public score in the description below. And as mentioned, we are on episode four of the Infinity Saga schedule. Schedule, I mean uh, saga retrospective, because I'm bringing up the schedule. That monstrosity for you guys at home. Uh, it feels like I'm a lot further in than four films, but I'm really not. I've realised it's it's not even a quarter of the films at, at this stage in time. However, come back to me in a week, and we'll have definitely been past the quarter mark. So we've got videos coming every Monday, Wednesday, and Saturday on the channel. Of course, all of them are pre-recorded, as is tonight. We are two weeks behind. At the time of doing this video, I've scared Chris because I've said the One Division finale has aired, but we haven't seen it because we're two weeks in the past. So. Don't comment spoilers for WandaVision. Go and join our WandaVision spoiler special where we'll be dissecting that finale. We don't know how long it goes on for at this rate in time, probably two hours. Maybe there's a surprise 10th episode and they haven't told us yet. And maybe the super secret cameo was Tobey Maguire. And I will look back in two weeks thinking he's an absolute fool <laughs> or he was on the money. But um, that being said, I think it's time to get into Thor. Um, we normally start these off really polite, really easy. And it's easier for phase one because we've not really been a channel at this point. Chris, can you remember the first time you saw this or your sort of memories with it, seeing it for the first time? Um, I remember seeing it. There was no sort of like song and dance or extra special story about it. It was another Marvel film. It was another comic book film, as I mentioned on all these. Whenever there's a new comic book film, um, even before the MCU, um, I'd always go and see it. Um, but I think by this point it was fairly cemented and you, it was the same. It was very similar in the way that Iron Man, you also had Incredible Hulk the same year. This was very similar in that you had Captain America followed a couple of months or later in the year after this one, I think. So you had another two Marvel films coming out in the same year. And at that point, I think it was, you were on the, on board for like the Avengers hype train at this point. I think you were getting introduced to characters who Charlie, I'm sure we'll talk about one of those characters later on who gets introduced, <laughs> who you know is going to be in future films. Um, 
and I think, yeah, with like the scheduling, knowing that Captain America, the first Avenger, and then that's going to lead into Avengers, you were starting to see like the bigger picture with this one. But um, Thor was a character again, like I haven't read all the comics, but uh, I love Norse mythology. So just the character really from that. But I actually think this was probably one of Marvel. I think this was Marvel's first gamble after the initial Iron Man and first getting that made and, you know, taking their first steps into it. Like, right, we're going to try and get this thing going. Thor's one of those characters. I'd say that predates Guardians of the Galaxy as being that weird, kooky, colorful one that is almost impossible to adapt from the graphic novel page to the to the big screen. And, you know, with the director, Kenneth Branagh, uh, they managed to do it very well. Uh, they stayed true to like the outrageous costumes, you know, like the weird Loki horned helmet, which looks absolutely ridiculous, but they make it work somehow in the film. Um, and, and absolute, you know, hats off to them at Marvel for getting this film made because this had quite a troubled production as well, I think, before this came out. Um, but I loved it. And if I'm going to go sort of like overall opinion on it, this is still to this day one of my favorite MCU films. It probably be in my top, th ooh, top three or four at least. Uh, and it's my favorite Thor film out of the main trilogy of Thor films as well. So I love this film. And I still love it now watching it before this review. Charlie, do you want to talk about your first time? If you can remember that, or I don't know what your memories are. We've never really spoke about Thor. To be fair, off off sort of camera, me and Charlie have known each other for a few years, and I don't think we've actually ever spoken about the Thor films, which is actually really intriguing, because I could tell you some of the other stuff, but not this one. Yeah, um, yeah, I do remember seeing it. I remember, again, like thinking, oh, this is like a weird one for them to be doing. Like we've had Iron Man, who's like this proper superhero, and then Hulk, everybody already knew so much about. So was like not that much to expect from it but then Thor was like who who who's Thor like the only thing anybody really knew about him was that yeah he was a, a god from some mythology that I didn't really know anything about at the time so yeah it was a risk and for me it just felt like they'd finally sort of like grasped the sci-fi element of comic books like because it can it kind of crosses over both genres which I really liked about it and I just remember thinking that they were trying something totally different totally new and it like really really worked but yeah total risk to start off with and I loved the inclusion of like I loved the cast I thought it was amazing I think getting Natalie Portman on board was just just genius she she brought in a whole new sort of I don't know like she she's such a she's such a classic actress like she's so brilliant in everything she does and to have her brought into a superhero film just seemed so, so like such a good choice um and yeah, Kenneth Branagh's direction is just perfect for it. It's it's almost Shakespearean what he did with it. It was it's like this this like really classic story, but with this crazy superhero sci-fi twist. So yeah, I loved it right from the start. But it's definitely not in my yeah. top three. <laughs> <laughs> Thor, Thor's an interesting one. I've got all these long drawn out stories for most MCU films, and this is a really sad one. This is I went to the cinema and I watched it and I didn't mind it. Um, I like this far more as I've grown older. Uh, I don't want to even say grown older. It's the first time I saw it, I was in this maze. As Chris, you said that the Avengers films are coming. At this point in time, you know there's a Captain America film coming out in a couple of months. You know after Captain America, there's going to be this big team of film. And uh, truth be told, I didn't know much about Thor, but I did know a lot enough about Captain America. And when this came out, all I remember being excited about was actually I'd rather watch Captain America when it comes out this August. So throwing my mind back then, I went in with strange, not even expectations. And then the Natalie Portman conversation was like, oh my God, it's Padme. I've I've just watched Black Swan, which, you know, at, at this point in my life, not getting into sort of non-Marvel stuff, but that was the time I'm looking into films more on a deeper level. Black Swan was this film that was like, to me, not game changing, but you know, the sort of first Oscar ceremony you remember watching and the first year you're taking, like actually looking at Oscar films. And it was a really weird one for me seeing her, oh, like she's stopped doing Star Wars, but... She's, she's in this comedy thing. And uh, I didn't really grasp the sci-fi, the fantasy stuff, because I loved the humour in it as a get-go. And I wouldn't say it was a comedy, but certainly the moment Thor lands in New Mexico, and, I mean, we'll get to Cat Dennings and some of the others later on, there is a lot of comedy injected in this. But I think as repeat viewings came down and as the years went by, I sort of appreciate that fantasy and that sort of sci-fi elements far more than that coming to earth sort of thing, which is what I originally did like. So I've had a weird relationship with this film that I, I liked it anyway, but I think I like it a lot more now than I probably did sort of seven, eight years ago. And I think that's really interesting for the discussion because I've not 
not really have the chance to have that on these Marvel films so far, especially one in one of the earlier entries in phase one when, you know, Chris, as you said, this was the first big risk. You know, everyone said Guardians was this, this was the risk. It was sci fi or the Avengers. Oh my God, how are you going to get six people sharing the screen together? But Thor was the, you know, we're leaving planet Earth. We're doing, I mean, I'm going to hand over if you the Lord of the Rings comparison, but here's our medieval fantasy origin story of the armies. And that's the kind of stuff that watching it again I was like, oh yeah, that is very. Not Lord of the Rings esque and Kenneth Branagh as well at the time. I only knew him as Gilder a lot. I didn't even know he did directing as the years went by. I discovered, like many other people, that oh my god, Gilder a lot is actually a film director. Uh, <laughs> obviously, uh, we, we are big fans of him on this channel, but that blew my mind as well. I think it was around the time Cinderella came out, I discovered mm-hmm. he was director, and I still can't comprehend it today that Gilder a lot is a, is a film director, a great director. But when you look back at Thor and Kenneth Branagh's career, he's probably one of the best people they could have actually got for bringing in that fantasy to modern superhero twists. Yeah, and as Charlie mentioned, the you know it is very Shakespearean, you know, sibling rivalries and wanting to overthrow kingdoms and fathers and everything. They're all sort of story beats that are told very well by Shakespeare and Kenneth Branagh himself being a Shakespearean actor. It's like a match made in heaven, really. And I think that was definitely the right approach to go to it. You mentioned the Lord of the Rings thing. I, I love all of that lore stuff. So when you've got uh, Anthony Hopkins at the beginning and he's like, Laufey and the Frost Giants and Jotunheim, I'm like, yes, give me, give me all of this. This is great. Give me more of this. So I think this was, um, if this had have failed, I, I don't know, you would have still had Captain America come out, obviously, because it was the same year, but I think this would have like really slammed the brakes on the acceleration up to the Avengers. I think like everything was riding on this. It is the space stuff. It is the more outlandish stuff. So I think it was very important that they got it right. And I think they did. Um, and I think that's probably why there's so many on Earth sections in this film. It's really a film in two halves. You've got like all of the great, asgard stuff and i kind of wish that the film was more or less exclusively set on asgard because i think that's the most interesting stuff about this film is just visually it looks gorgeous as well the way they imagined asgard and you've got the um the kingdom and it almost looks like um sort of like a pipe organ like a church organ or something that's how i always sort of like i identify the look of it uh so i love the conceptual design of everything and then we go to earth and we get like this kooky comedy and cat denins is there just for comic relief and it's terrible and it's awful and she's got better now she's in one division but this was back in the days where she was first introduced and they just suck all of my enjoyment out of this film when you get to those and it's it's the very sort of tried and tested fish out of water stuff and it might get a chuckle out of you but I like the more in-depth stuff on Asgard and the relationship between, you know, Thor and his father and the rivalry with Loki and just seeing Sif and the Warriors 3 and Heimdall. Like, I love all of that stuff and the interplay between those characters in that kingdom. Uh, and I guess that's kind of a thing that's gone on with Thor films as well, that the Asgard stuff to me is always way more interesting than anything that's actually going on on Earth. But I guess they put the Earth stuff in there so that viewers weren't completely alienated by this entire, you know, set on Asgard world. Yeah, it's the cheesy lines from uh, from Darcy's character. Things like, uh, oh, I'm going to put this on Facebook. And she takes a picture yeah. of Thor, of him smiling and and all the uh, like trucker guys like drinking bud and trying to lift the hammer and stuff. They're just easing people in, I think. It was, it was because like we said, it was such a risk. I think they were just trying to, cushion it a little bit so that people mm-hmm. wouldn't be like oh i don't want to see a film about space like <laughs> so maybe that i don't know maybe that's why they tried it but it glues it all together quite nicely yeah and as well when you mentioned that one of the things that kind of jumping out that always hit me was the sword in the stone sort of comparison i've always had yeah. that i remember that credit scene of iron man 2 was you know i didn't know who much about thor but i think everyone knew i mean i didn't even know it was called yawn back then but everyone knew that was thor's hammer and just that concept of, you know, he, well, I'm not going to do the Anthony Hopkins quotes, but, you know, whoever can be worthy can can lift it. And it, it is that really obvious sword in the stone. So for now, mythology-wise, I would imagine that Norse mythology is a bit older than uh, King Arthur and the Round Table and all that nonsense. I don't know if this is also in Norse mythology that only the worthy can lift the hammer of I don't know if that's a Marvel thing, but I loved that sort of, how can you introduce that to like a mass audience? I think that was a really smart way to do it. Because immediately where we are now with, I guess, Endgame, you know, we've seen Vision lift Yornir, we've seen obviously Thor lift it, we've obviously had the amazing Captain America scenes, which we can talk about in a couple of months. But when you take it back to that film, how it's so easy for them straight away to not just establish the, the character, but the law of that, you know, 
only sort of the elite can really lift this hammer by having Loki failing to do it, by having Thor failing to do it for half the film as well. I thought that made it immediately like a really interesting spin on it and sort of delving into his character side. I think that separates him straight away from the rest that it helped him to stand out and it helped that weapon also stand out and be sort of the iconic thing it's become. Yeah, and as far as I, I mean, I don't know everything there is to know about Norse mythology. I know bits and pieces. I, I think that the whole Excalibur kind of thing, whoever shall be worthy shall wield the power of Thor. I think that's just for the movie. I think it's just a weapon that Thor has, but he is just like the mightiest and the strongest to wield it in Norse mythology, as far as I know. But it's quite an interesting concept, and I like that the the person of being worthy because, and this sort of like goes with my argument that I think this is the strongest Thor film um, because it's the only Thor film where Thor has a character arc, in my opinion. Now, it's been a while since I've seen Thor The Dark World, as far as I can remember, it's him just fighting Christopher Eccleston. <laughs> and then three, he doesn't really have so much of an arc. It's just that these villains have taken over Asgard and he's just sort of like got to go and kill them. But this one, from the ground up, you, his introductory scene, he is this arrogant, sort of spoiled brat of a child, uh, not necessarily a bad person, but very egotistical. And then throughout the film by the end he becomes kingly you know and, and follows in his father's footsteps so it's this really cool um it's a really cool sort of self-contained character journey for thor in this film and then obviously you throw loki in there as well uh the vengeful brothers but the interplay that they have you know that deep down they love each other as brothers but it's just you know loki is what it he is a force of nature you know mischief and cunning um, and it's it adds to that tragedy at the end between them all. So I think that this one's the best for me because it feels so central to Thor as a character and you see the most growth out of him. And also just from tonally as well. Now, I know we're not talking about Thor Ragnarok just yet. That's many, many reviews later on down the line. And I know that for a lot of people, Ragnarok is usually in their top list of favorite MCU films. I never liked Ragnarok because it it felt too much like Guardians of the Galaxy to me. They kind of doubled down on the comedy side of Thor. And I never liked that. I, I like when they kind of, this was the only film out of the three, and to some extent Dark World as well, where they took Thor seriously and the mythology around it and the character himself. He felt like a real character. Yes, he does have some sort of uh, lofty statements, which when he says them on Earth and obviously the, the clash of cultures and everything, you get a chuckle out of that, but they really kind of doubled down on the humor I found as we got deeper into these Thor films, which, and I never really liked that comedic side to Thor. I liked when he was an actual character, like an Asgardian King and not just played for laughs, which I felt that the series kind of went in that direction as they went on. Yeah, that's really interesting actually, because it's, it's fun. It, it's really fascinating to go back and watch the first Thor because I'm so familiar with the more recent films and obviously like through Endgame and like you say Ragnarok he he is this like larger than life kind of comedic character obviously Endgame he has his struggles but he's still kind of crowbarred in there for a bit of comedy value and yeah watching the first one again it made me realize actually he's a very he, he's a very like serious person he's got a big personality but it doesn't mean his personality needs to be funny all the time like he he takes his his place in Asgard very seriously, and um, yeah, his character arc in this film is brilliant. I mean, he yeah, he goes from this spoiled like bratty teenager to a man who has responsibilities, and he has fallen in love, and he's suddenly got so much more to him than just being the son of Odin. And um, yeah, his yeah his character arc's great, and Loki as well. I mean, he he going into this film the first time watching it I wouldn't have even known who Loki is so for the big twist to be that he's actually out he's not even his brother he's out there to get the throne all that kind of stuff is just great it's just like a great penny drop moment and mm -hmm. I think the film's full of them I think it's got so many brilliant just moments when Thor can't lift the hammer the first time amazing and then when he finally can lift the hammer amazing like it's just yeah it's full of huge cinematic moments yeah, that's really good of the Loki stuff, actually, because sort of on, on a Thor side piece, I wonder, I'll, I'll figure it out next week, maybe when I have to rewatch it, but I wonder if the reception to the Dark World, they, they're like, oh, we need to we need to take this in a completely different direction now, and maybe that's what led to, to Ragnarok, because I remember that Ragnarok trailer dropping, I was like, I didn't imagine Thor being like this, and you know, we'll get to that in a couple of films' time, but that's probably the biggest Thor film I've 180'd on in terms of initial opinion to how I feel now. But the Loki stuff's interesting because 
when they set up all the frost giant stuff, I loved all that lore stuff. It reminds me more of 300 than Lord of the Rings. I don't know why. But again, it's whenever you've got someone with a great voice doing a voiceover, giving an origin story to a world, to an environment. I love that kind of stuff, even though that is I'm not the biggest fantasy fan. You know, Chris, not to get excited, but the opening of Lord of the Rings, all of that stuff. Love that kind of thing. And when you get to Thor, it is that he's so different now. When you're going back to the films, this is 10 years old as well. When you're seeing how much he's changed, it does make me think that this it's a completely different character. Even the fact he went back to short hair, I think he's going to have long hair on the new Thor film. I'm not not too fussed about haircuts. I'm not a Harry Styles Dunkirk fan. Um, <laughs> however, that being said, I think it's time to talk about Loki because even watching this for the first time, thinking, "Wow, this is a great villain. This is a great character." I am truly intrigued to think how many people would have sat there saying, "Oh, in ten years' time." He's going to have been in like what five more Marvel films, and he'll be getting his own TV series spin off because Tom Hilston is fantastic in this. And I don't mean this is a criticism. Loki has changed 180. As much as Thor's story has changed, they've switched character to Thor. My issue with Loki is that every time we get Loki now, it's like, yes, I love seeing Tom Hilston play Loki. There's a good character in there. However, of course, he's going to do a trick at the end of the scene and you always get that revelation of Loki. And it's really nice to go back to original Loki, who was far smarter, who had a master plan to take control. I say this in the first Avengers films, I think with the, with the peak of that, but I don't know, maybe if it's it's time I've become fed up a bit or fed up of the sort of people screaming at the BFI when he appeared in Infinity War for them to cry moments later. Um, yeah, I don't know what your thoughts on Loki because he's a very interesting character. And again, going back to his roots was really nice because people don't talk about him in the first Thor film as well. They always talk about the Avengers, but really, he's. I think this is his best film by a mile. I think it's his best film as well. I, I do remember liking him in the Dark World, though. Um, I do remember that part where there's the whole fake out in that film as well. Maybe it's just because that film's absolutely dreadful, so I'm just clinging on to any, anything, any <laughs> scrap from that film that I had any kind of moderate enjoyment of. But um, yeah, I think Loki is an interesting character in that I think that he's almost become a personality now more than a character. And I think that's all to do pretty much exclusively that Tom Hiddleston's playing the guy, right? Uh, and that sort of like has increased now to the point where you mentioned he's getting his own um, Disney Plus series. Um, he's, he's fantastic in this. I absolutely love him. And um, I like how they integrate his uh, deceptive abilities in there as well, especially in the final fight that he has with Thor, how you have the moment where... Um, he's like dangling off the edge of the bridge and then it's a hologram and then he multiplies himself like 50 times. I love seeing all that stuff. Again, I mentioned the the costumes. I'm glad that I like when um, film studios stay true to the off the page costumes as much as they can. Uh, we'll talk about Hawkeye because I was very disappointed that they didn't put him in the, the purple stuff that he wears in the comic book. But uh, maybe I can understand why. But no. Um, Loki's brilliant in this. Um, real scenes of emotion as well. Like the bits where he he breaks down when he gets the revelation about where he comes from and why he was taken. You believe it. And in a weird way, and, and these are all the best villains in, um, well, just villains in general. Marvel only has a few great villains, I would say, in the MCU, but the best ones are the ones where you can kind of understand their story and see where they're coming from. You know, Thanos, you can throw that name out there. And I think Loki it can be thrown in there as well, specifically from this film. But then, as I mentioned, he kind of becomes a personality. He becomes the trait. Um, and then I know this is sort of like going on a tangent to the MCU as a whole, but the, the concept of death with Loki it is forever damaged now. Like I remember seeing that first scene of Infinity War thinking like, oh, he's he's out of it finally. And, you know, Marvel can't get rid of him. He's a crowd pleaser. Quite rightly so. He is brilliant. But yeah, it's going back to the the simpler times of the first Thor film when he was an actual character in the film. Yeah, Marvel, are, they're risky with death. It's something that I, I'm always a little bit like, but are they actually dead? Like, is it the, is that the last time we're going to actually see them? Like, it, it's the same with, they brought WandaVision out when we've already lost Vision. Like, Quite. do you know what I mean? It's like, we can, we can always see, we can always see them coming back at some point. And I think, but I think the beauty with Loki is that they don't even pretend like, yeah, we've killed him. And yeah, his death in Infinity War is amazing. What an amazing moment to open that film with. But also, like, Endgame's coming. We know he's going to be in it somehow. Like, we don't know how it's going to happen, but he's going to pop up. And um, I think, yeah, his introduction in Thor was just, like, 
introduction and then demise and then he comes back you know it's like it, it's this constant play with what can they do with this character how can they keep him going and yeah he's got such a big fan following that they're just not going to let him go why would they like they'd be stupid too um but Tom Hiddleston does such a fantastic job and I don't even know how well known he was at the time when he got cast in Thor really I think he kind of established himself in that role and people just fell in love with him even though he's such a terrible person you know Loki is <laughs> awful like he treats everyone terribly just to get what he wants it's, it's not but for some reason people love him so keep for a while I say keep him going keep keep bringing Loki back I'm, I'll be happy to watch him in anything yeah I think the Loki is interesting actually because I wanted to talk about this. I don't know if you guys both know this but Tom Hilston originally uh auditioned for the role of Thor um maybe we'll get that in the Marvel what if series <laughs> to this day I still I think we're the same here. It's like the Sam Rockwell and Iron Man discussion. You couldn't see anyone not being Thor except Chris Hemsworth, but you can't see Tom Hiddleston as Thor. You can't yeah. see him with the hammer doing all that kind of stuff. And as great as Tom Hiddleston is, he would have been horrendously miscast as anyone but Loki because I would say he's in the, or oh, oh, is it is it too risky to say the Robert Downey Jr. or where no one can ever play that character. Like he is definitively that character now. And I, I don't think Marvel could ever try and do something else like that. There are a couple of characters that, you know, someone down the line would have the balls to recast that shouldn't. Let's say Chris Evans' Captain America on paper, it's a role that so many people could do. You wouldn't want it to happen, but I don't think there's anyone else that can be Loki. And I think he's right up there, that very top tier with the Downey Juniors. And as well, a really funny one, um, the other audition for Thor was uh, Thor's younger brother, Liam Hemsworth, who... I think we're also probably glad didn't get that one because, yes, we've seen him in the Hunger Games and I think the Expendables 3. But again, Chris Hemsworth is is absolutely... I, I don't want to say perfect. He's phenomenal in this. I think as the series has developed, Chris Hemsworth, the roles... Maybe it's down to that character development issue as well that the role seems to have evolved into Chris Hemsworth more than Chris Hemsworth becoming Thor. I don't know if there's a bit of both in especially with that comedic stuff. And to be fair, in terms of, I mean, Chris, you've seen 2016 Ghostbusters, I haven't. When he has had comedy roles, I believe he's been all right in them. I mean, the, one of my favorite roles of his is actually in, a, in Rush. Um, very different film, but it's it's interesting seeing how his career switched down the line and Thor's changed with him. I don't know if that's me making an overstatement. It's interesting going back and seeing him with completely bleach blonde hair in this film. Uh, that was weird. It reminded me of, uh, do you remember the first series of Game of Thrones when all the Lannisters legitimately had blonde hair and then as the seasons went on, it kind of got more auburn and then it just became brown by like season eight or whatever, where they just stopped trying. Kind of reminded me of this. It was very strange. So even the eyebrows, like every every bit of hair on his face was just dyed blonde. It was just strange. But um, no, I think Hemsworth, again, I can't imagine anyone playing that role he he delivered on absolutely everything that he needed to the scenes of emotion he played it very well and he can do comedies you know he's established himself in comedy i don't think ghostbusters 2016 is particularly a good comparison of that though and probably not men in black international either but um what he can deliver what he's presented essentially uh, he's handed that script he can try and make that script work as much as he can but um the times where you know he is legitimately funny I think it's just that they, I don't know whether they looked at the books and was like, what do audiences respond to most? Let's sort of like go in that direction. I don't know how much input Hemsworth had with the character itself, or if he just shows up on set, what script have I got to work with today? What are we doing? Okay, brilliant. And he delivers it. But yeah, I mean, he looks the part, like fair play to him, like that the physicality that he has in this film, like he absolutely, you know, the hard work that goes into that side of things as well. Um, he absolutely nailed it. And just in terms of the look as well, Love the costume in this one as well, the red cape. I really wish he'd wear the helmet more, though. He gets, like, maybe a handful of scenes in this film where we see him. I think it's his introductory scene, actually, where he's going to be crowned king. And he's got the sweet silver winged helmet on, which is Thor from the comic books. And I was like, keep the helmet on. That looks so cool. And then they kind of don't ever wear it again. But at least they homage it in some way. Um, but yeah, no, in, in terms of casting, this film absolutely nailed it for the main core cast, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I actually didn't know that about um, about Liam Hemsworth. I, I'm not sure he would have fit the bill. Uh, Chris was just he was just made for it, wasn't he? Like, I, and again, like Tom Hiddleston, I don't think he was that well known before this film. Mm -hmm. So, like, imagine just going straight into this iconic character, so which already has so many fans worldwide, and just totally embodying it. Like, he just smashes it completely. And yeah, I I kind of miss the helmet too. It'd be nice if they could bring that back a bit more. Mm -hmm. 
it's just so iconic like it, it just tops off the costume perfectly so but yeah all the casting in this film is great I mean who, Anthony Hopkins in a superhero film yes who, yeah. who thought that would work and it works it's so perfect mm. yeah he's just great the whole all the cast perfect yeah I was gonna say actually a conversation about Odin because he's another character that as the films have progressed you've had far less and less of and Anthony Hopkins is a fascinating because at the time of recording the Oscar nominations aren't out but he is one of the favourites to be up for it again uh, in, in The Father. And I'm not saying he's had a De Niro, but he, suddenly Anthony Hopkins was doing comedies and not really dramas. And then he cropped up in the Marvel film and then he was doing weird comedies again. And now we're seeing sort of, uh, not not like a resurgence, but we're seeing him in really good roles again. And of the, certainly of the Thor films, I think as Odin, you can't really go wrong with it. If you've got this sort of, you know, Norse mythology, this god who is, you know, the the the, the king who's going to be the person that tells those stories. If you want the screen presence, and again, that Shakespearean sort of style that Kenneth Branagh is doing, Anthony Hopkins is, is absolutely perfect to be Odin, especially at the age, and certainly in this film more than the others, that this is very much an Odin that's ready to pass the mantle down to Thor. You need that sort of elder king, and I thought he was phenomenal in this, and it's a shame about the sequels that we don't get as much of him, or we don't ever get him being as good as in this, but I think he brings a gravitas to the role. And I think, again, that film, when you look at this, because even Idris Elba as Heimdall, when they made the first one, I, Idris Elba wasn't the name he is now. They got mm. very lucky that he got bigger between the films. I think that's why Heimdall obviously got more stuff to do in the later Thor films. But I think Kenneth Branagh absolutely nailed the casting for this. Maybe the human side of it's not great. Not the human side of it, sorry. The, um, the Earth stuff's not the best. And, you know, you get some very two-dimensional shield agents as well, that kind of stuff. But... For, for the mythology side of it, I thought was perfect. Yeah, um, Anthony Hopkins is one of my favourite things in this film. Um, he nails like the drama as well, but you can also tell that he's chewing the scenery in a lot of scenes as well. I I'm trying to remember the scene. There's a bit where he's um, Thor's back talking to him and he almost goes like, eh! Like, I, I, it's just, he's having the time of his life in this costume. He must think like, how did I wake up here? What the hell's happening? Um, but there's enough of the the dramatic moments, and I mean, he's Anthony Hopkins for Christ's sake. Like the guy, you know, the guy can deliver, and he absolutely does. And similar to Thor, and like most of the characters surrounding Thor, as the sequels went on, by the time we get to Ragnarok, Odin's just completely so far removed from the character he was in this film. I remember seeing Ragnarok for the first time, and I know everyone loves the comedy in it, but they really just doubled down with the comedy in that film. And when it got to Odin. And I was seeing all of his little shticks and antics in that third film. I was like, look how they massacred my boy. Like, how, how did we go from how Odin, all father, to whatever the hell he was in that third film? I don't remember much of him in the second film, I must admit. I, I, I'm going to have to go back to that, I think, and just watch that in my own time, if I can force myself through the dark world one more time. Um, but yeah, no, he's brilliant. And all the supporting cast as well. Like, If I'm just going to throw it out there, I, I need to check her name, actually. The, the actress who plays Sif. I really like her in the film as well. Oh, All of Jane, these. Jane Alexander. Yeah, that's it. Um, brilliant. Where is she? I know. I think she's coming back for Thor four. Hopefully, it'd be nice to get sort of a wrap up to her character where she's been this whole time. Um, and also, oh god, I'm useless with names. The actress who plays Frigga, uh, Renee Russo. Uh, I really like her as well as Thor's mother. Obviously, gets more to do in the second film. Um, yeah, I just I love all the interplay. As I said, that's that's all the strongest stuff for me is all the characters and everything and all the relationships at Asgard. Yeah, I think Sif is a great character. I really wish she was utilized more. Um, I think there's a lot more story from her. Obviously, like to do with the sort of background love story that's going on, but also I just think she's an absolutely fierce warrior, and I'd really like to see a bit more of that. I think that is one thing that is a little bit lacking in this film is the female representation. A lot of the female characters are just there either for comedy or for romance. And I I mean, Jane's a strong character, but Jane was put in to be a love interest. And it mm -hmm. would be really nice, obviously with Thor Love and Thunder coming out and Jane coming back, hopefully they're gonna really, really power through with a bit more, bit more girl power, I think would be nice to see. Um, but yeah, I mean, she, she's not a bad character, but I just think it would, yeah, just think it'd be nice to see a bit more of her. And also Sif, it'd be great to see what else she can give other than just doughy eyes every time she's on screen. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a really good point, actually, because obviously in Ragnarok, they do kill off, well, it's, they kill off not Lady Sif, but the other three in that short moment where I don't know if anyone actually cared. I think that was still my impression watching years later. I cared. No one... I cared. The guy who looks like Gimli. What's his name? Volkstag is his yeah. name or whatever. Yes. That eats like a whole boar or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's 
and they leave her alive. They just don't put her in the film. And I, Chris, not to bring your favorite Star Wars film into it, but it's kind of reminds me of the um, uh, the Knights of Ren that Ryan Johnson <laughs> takes over this film, and he's kind of there like, well, there's no place for him, but they're not mine, so I'm not going to kill them off. So I'll leave it for the next guy. And mm-hmm. I think Tyka did that with Lady Sif. I think otherwise he would have brought her in. He would have killed her off. And I think she was on Agents of Shield at some point or something like that. So it's clear they want to do something with her. And I think Tyka probably just hadn't didn't know what to do or didn't have a story to tell. So basically we said Charlie as well. I, I think it's the same with Jane that I think what surprised me about Natalie Portman going back to this film is that I don't she doesn't strike me as a type that just signs up to play those romantic co-leads anymore. And obviously she had yeah. the big falling out during uh Thor 2 filming. I think that was more down to the the Patty Jenkins treatment and obviously how she left quite last minute and stuff like that. And it does feel weird seeing because I think with Natalie Portman, you can look at her career and sort of chunks. You've got the sort of the teen years, you've got your heat, your Leon, the Phantom Menace. Then you've got whilst the prequels are happening, you've got her taking on the really serious roles in between those films. And we know that she had the displeasure of the Star Wars at the time. And then you kind of get to Thor and it's like, well, she's just dropped her Oscar win. And then you've got Chris, what's that one you, you always joke about? The uh, awful James Franco one. Uh, there's like an awful comedy with her in it, James Franco. It's a weird oh, Archer thing. Oh. Is it year one? You know, is that, is that year, oh, yeah. Something like that. And and then she drops off all that and she's doing roles like Jackie again. And I think, to be fair, there's a conversation with Natalie Portman that the, when they announced that she was coming back to... I mean, not, not even announced that she was coming back to Thor. When she turned up to the Endgame premiere in America and everyone was like, what's she doing there? They didn't mean it in a horrible way. They mean it in a... Natalie Portman hates mean? Marvel. Yeah, yeah. And, and then obviously, I know they use uh, old footage of her in Endgame, but they probably still have to approve something with her. And it's kind of all built to her as her. And I'm excited to see it because I think she's a character that gets next to no development. And I think Natalie Portman, she's one of my favorite actors. It's an absolute waste of having her on. And I'm fine yeah. to keep the prequels as meme culture. You know, she was really young when she did them still. But in this day and age of the film she's done, her coming back to Marvel to me, especially the comic series we know they're doing. I think they're doing the cancer subplot, which is going to pick up Yolner and all that sort of stuff. I'm really excited to see what they do with it because as much as I love Ragnarok, it is weird to get that Thor film. I mean, I love Valkyrie. I love Tessa Thompson in it, but when they switch up the supporting cast as well as the the sort of genre, because it goes from sort of fantasy to outright sci-fi comedy, it's Chris Duty Guys to Galaxy. So I'm really interested to see how Taika handles it. Granted, it's sort of 20 films away uh, from where Thor 1 is. <laughs> But um, there's definitely more that could be said about some of those roles because even even the other knights, his Thor's mates, they're cool. They've got funny moments, but to people like you, don't really get to know them. And the Gimli one, I think everyone likes the most. You know, there's the the weird guy that somehow survived getting stabbed with the icicle, which I never really understood. And I just think when they died in Ragnarok, it was just like a ha. Huh. Was that meant to be an emotional moment? Because it didn't feel like it. It should have been, and I think that's just a question that the sequels didn't really utilize them or make them prominent enough. Like you can put someone in the first film, but if you don't bring them back for the second or don't use them all that much in the second, and then they're completely absent from the third, there's going to be no continuity when you do get to their fates and they do die, uh, which is a shame because I do think that, I mean, I haven't read any of the Thor comics, but I've got to assume that the Sith and the Warriors 3 are quite focal characters and lifelong companions of Thor. Uh, so it's kind of a shame when they just sort of got offhandedly. Uh, dismissed at the end of it all but uh, just going back to Natalie Portman um, I would say that she's one of the weakest things in this film and this is not down to Natalie Portman because I know that she can act I don't know if it's a question of the chemistry between her and Chris Hemsworth or if it's down to the script or if it's a combination of both but I never bought the romance between either of them in this film Uh, Charlie as you mentioned it felt that you know someone's mostly they're just in it for like a romantic subplot and you don't I don't feel the romance between those two now going back to sort of like Iron Man and Pepper Potts I do believe that and the natural chemistry Mm. that they have they you know she just basically falls in love with him over the course of like a day it feels very Disney and there's just sort of a a physical attraction there and it never kind of goes beyond that at any point and I was trying to compare it to like other relationships and in superhero films and the only other one I can think of that kind of starts that way is the original Superman film where you've got um, Lois Lane and Superman and she's immediately physically attracted to him and she's flirting with him and everything like that. But it feels very natural. But the charisma and the charm that both of those actors have, Christopher Reeve and Margot Kidder, they make it work. And there is a connection there, even within just that first film. 
in this one, like he just kind of whips his shirt off, shows off his six pack, and then she's just like <laughs> falling into his arms. Basically, there is one scene that's quite nice though, and I do like this film probably more than a lot of the other Marvel films because it, it actually has a scene where you can just sit back and it lets the characters breathe. And it's where are they on like um, the roof or something looking at the stars and he, he's drawing out the realms for, her and you know, she's clearly passionate about it. And he's kind of telling her that where I come from magic and science and one in the same, that's a really nice scene. And it's where you can just let the characters sort of develop a bit more. I needed more scenes like that, but then you have the scene where there's the destroyer and he just sort of gives her a, you know, a smack on the lips and then he's off to Asgard and it, it never yeah. felt earned. It never got to that point for me, I don't think. Yeah, and there's the bit they get right towards the end of the film when, when Sif is talking to Frigga and she's saying, oh, he misses her. And it's like, he's known her for like 10 yeah. hours. Like, how can he be in love and miss her already? Like, it's crazy. So yeah, I agree. It all just happens way too quickly, way too, like, it, it's too fabricated. It's it's unrealistic and, unfor and unfortunate because Jane is such a, a realist. Like she's a scientist. Like she's not a like airy fairy romantic. She, I, I think, I just don't think that like instant romance is is realistic for a character like her. Um, mm -hmm. And again, you get another Darcy moment where she talks about him when he's got his shirt off, and it's just like I don't think Jane would care. Like I don't think that would be important to. Yes, of course he's incredibly good looking, but that's not what. That's not the point. The point is he's just come from another dimension, and she's a scientist. Like that should be what it should be about, not about the fact that he's beautiful, which of course he is. But you know that's not the point. <laughs> so yeah, I agree completely. No, that, that's a good point as well. I, I was something to say, I'd completely forgotten. I don't know if you want to talk about Darcy much because I don't want to do Wonder Vision spoilers, but Chris, as you said that, <laughs> no, let, let's just let's just gloss over it. It's nice that 10 years later she's had a redemption. I'm just going to leave that there. I want people to comment their Darcy thoughts because that's a very interesting one at the moment because suddenly, you know, when they, when she popped up in, end, uh, not in game, and Wonder Vision was like, oh, and then now it's like, oh, I don't mind it. And I think we both said before that oh, when we go back and watch Thor, are we going to have different opinions on her? Are we going to like her more? And still wasn't. And again, maybe that is the writing. And it's, I think it is a combination, again, going back to Natalie Portman's character, that they're just not very well written because they don't even have chemistry as a as a scientist and student. And I think, I think uh, I always forget the Skarsgård names, which is the first name, but Skarsgård's amazing, the one that is in this one. Um, <laughs> he's believable as a scientist. He's great in it. And he, you, when he's talking science, I would sit there and listen and be like, I think he's talking about whereas I can't even remember if Natalie Portman had like a scientific monologue, but if she did it, I don't know that it wouldn't feel natural. And it, again, because they've chucked in this really forced sort of hammy romance, it takes aside from the fact that Charlie that she's a reader, she's a scientist, that you don't get that. And there's a couple of good scenes, and I think their chemistry is lacking, and maybe that's led down to other stuff down. I think Tessa Thompson and, and Hemsworth are, are far better together. And that's why they put them in Men in Black and realise that Taika Waititi is the reason it works. Um, and <laughs> I kind of wanted to use that to move on to, I know I'm kind of jumping ahead, but sort of talking about character relationships with one another, going back to sort of Loki, one of, to me, the best scenes in this film is Odin and Loki uh, down the bottom of the stairs. When they're having that talk about the revelation that he took him as a child, that feels like acting. We spoke in our Malcolm and Marie review about it as well, that when you've got two actors just going at one another, it's always really interesting to see how they do it, how natural it feels. And I think Hiddleston and, um, oh my God, how I feel, I'm going to say what the hell am I on about? Um, <laughs> Anthony I've got, Hopkins. I've got, I've got, Anthony Hopkins, I don't know what else is going on. Um, I don't want to see Anthony Hopkins as, as Pepper Potts, thank you very much. That'd be a very, <laughs> very different film. It'd be, it'd be funny though, <laughs> uh, very weird. Um, no, when those two are going at each other, it, it's kind of sat there, like how do you get a scene like that? And then you've got the sort of awkward, Darcy scenes with Natalie Portman and and Thor and it's like you know you've got the Shakespeare and then you've got something else and, and of course it's a studio film I think it's fair to say that back in Thor they were probably the directors don't want to say had more power than they do now it's a bit unfair but certainly back then there wasn't as much a Avengers structure to follow this was still in the very early we're, we're getting to that point so we've still got a bit more freedom than they might have now and I think when you sort of compare scenes, it just stands out for the wrong reasons. I don't know if anyone else is the same. It, was, it feels like Branner's favouriting the sort of mythology side compared to the, the Earth stuff. 
Yeah, and that shines through. I mean, this film had three, uh, sorry, three screenwriters. So I don't know if that had something to do with it. If it was sort of like passed from pillar to post and constant rewrites, and oh no, we need to inject more humor into this. Oh no, we need a a love story because audiences love a love story in their blockbuster film. And then you've got all the Shield stuff as well. Now maybe Shield's sort of bigger presence in this film. I guess they had a big presence in Iron Man too. I keep forgetting that one, uh, probably for good reason, but. <laughs> It felt like they were really doubling down on that. And I don't know if that's just like a natural progression that it would have gone in that way anyway, because we are getting closer to Avengers and we're not sort of in the infancy now where we were with the first Iron Man film where S.H.I.E.L.D. would just get a mention or there'd be a character like sort of almost like walking through a scene. Now we have like an actual plot point, like the second act really is all to do with S.H.I.E.L.D. and you've got Hawkeye and Coulson comes back and, you know, we're setting up all these threads, all these characters, all these things gonna, that are going to lead to something in the future. It doesn't feel quite as crowbarred in as it was in Iron Man 2. Iron Man 2 did feel very much like a teaser trailer for everything. Here's, you know, Nick Fury. Here's Black Widow. Just throw all these names in there. This actually ties into the moment, though, with um, with Thor trying to lift the hammer, which is one of my favorite scenes. And we'll talk about the music. Oh, boy, we'll talk about the soundtrack for this thing hopefully <laughs> later on. That moment just carries so much weight to it. Uh, it was I remember the scene in the trailer as well, which was the the slow motion drop kick to the uh, to the grunt in yes. the rain, which is awesome <laughs> and it's still awesome to this day. So yeah. although there is a lot of shield stuff in this film, it still feels necessary to the plot because they do tie it into the plot with Thor. And one of my favorite scenes is where Loki comes to Earth. I never knew if that was like a vision because he's dressed in sort of like everyday clothes. So I was like, can people see him? Why is he wearing a regular average yeah. jumper? Is if he's sort of transmitting himself from Asgard, why can't he just wear his Asgard uniform? Maybe because it would have looked ridiculous in the context of that scene if he's in his horned helmet and everyone else is mm. in normal clothes. I don't know. But um, yeah, and then Hawkeye shows up for a scene and then leaves and doesn't really do anything. He doesn't even get to fire <laughs> a bow and arrow in this film. They tease it and then nothing happens. So, yeah, that's that was more to me the... Um, it's similar to Civil War, you know, where it's just like, we're just going to completely deviate the plot right now and talk 15 minutes about Spider-Man because we need to set up Spider-Man. It kind of felt a little bit like that, probably not to that degree, but similar to that. Uh, obviously, like, one of my favourite moments in the whole MCU is is Coulson saying, we need eyes in the sky with a gun, and then it shows him picking up his burn arrows. Just such a great introduction for someone who loves the character as much as I do, um, which is probably only me, but that's, that's okay. <laughs> so I'm fine with that. Um, uh, you've thrown me off a tangent because you mentioned Hawkeye and I don't even know what I was going to say. So there you go. Hawkeye is the best thing about this film. <laughs> I'll, I'll jump in with Hawkeye because he's, when, when I saw it the first time, I didn't know that he's an Avenger. I was like, hey, is that guy from Hurt Locker? What's he doing here? <laughs> And then, like, you know, like, a year down, I was like, ah, okay, makes sense now. And what makes it funnier, look, again, looking back, because it's been 10 years, you know, he's getting his own show now, and he's had, uh, to me, he was great. Finally. Yep, yeah, we had the amazing scene at the start of Endgame, which to me carries more weight than the actual ending of Infinity War now. Um, when it's like, oh, we're going to delay the reveal, they've, like, they've got shots of him, like, the back of his head running, or the cranes dangling, so, like, you're really delaying the reveal of like checks notes hawkeye and <laughs> not horribly put it's the fact that he's just in a black leather jacket like he looks like anybody and it's even the build-up of oh we need him and he's like picking a weapon to use on there like again not to harp on it would he really have gone for the gun over the, the bow and arrow first of course he wouldn't have it's we know what the build-up is and i think it's just funny looking back now with that scene and yeah it's what chris said he doesn't do anything he just he just aims and when i was rewatching, i was thinking i was like does he actually speak in this one? I'm trying to remember now. I was like, no, yeah, he does. He, yeah. get, he, get, he gets like he gets like two, three lines. We'll see him in yeah. we'll see him in Avengers next year where he won't get much to do either. Um just gets a bang bang on the head, doesn't he? But we'll get to Age of Ultron eventually. That was the sort of the apology, I guess. But it's a very strange I d I don't I don't want to say it's forced because it kind of is, but it's what you said, Chris, that the shield stuff's really natural to this film. That if anyone was investigating this hammer appearing it would be those guys because they're doing all that weird defense stuff. And I think there's a place for them. I don't think they overstay their welcome. That's the difference. You get the odd joke that goes on too long, but you know, they get out of the film. You don't see them again. They're not cutting back and forth with them every couple of minutes during a finale. It's, it's straight away. You know, they've, they've done their part. They've gone home. Thor's gone back to Asgard. It's, it's all finished. And I quite like that. And I think 
it's kind of really nice as well, not to sort of go back to Shield, but pre pre Winter Soldier, it's oh, remember Shield, and you know you forget with Phase Three that it's been this insane Infinity Saga stones, this this this. There's not been that sort of government and I think even sort of talking about WandaVision very briefly, the fact you've got sword back, there's like, oh yeah, like the guys in suits, we've not had them for a couple of years now. So there's a place for them and, and I think phase one they're they're perfectly placed to bring everyone together. And yeah, I th- I think we just get enough of them, not too much. Yeah, there was quite a few other little Easter eggs that I noticed. Um where Skarsgård mentions about, I know a guy uh, who works in gamma radiation. I was like, oh, I never caught, well, I, I probably have caught that before, but I completely forgot about it, especially having watched Hulk um, a few days ago going to this one. That was quite cool to have that thrown in. Was this the one with the Infinity Gauntlet in the vault? Because yeah. um, I can never pick it out. I have never seen it myself. I think I've seen it on a picture. I couldn't remember if it was this one or Dark World. Uh, obviously, that gets retconned later on in the MCU. Um I guess they wrote themselves into the into a corner with that one, but I'm trying to think of any other um, Easter eggs. Really, Stark gets a name drop when um, the Destroyer shows up, which I quite liked. I did like that one. Is that is that one of Stark's? Probably. Um, but they're the only other Easter eggs that I can think of. And then you've got the great Stanley cameo, and I do really like the cameo in this one from Stanley, where he's the guy in the pickup truck trying to uh, drag me all near out. Uh, that always gets a laugh out of me. Um, my Wi-Fi actually dropped out then, so I'm not quite sure what you're all talking about, but I also love Stanley. <laughs> I think he has a great cameo in this one. Um, great moment from him. Um, as always, he always just steals the show, whatever he's doing. So, yeah. Um, and I love the Stark name drop. I think it's great. It starts to start bringing things together a little bit and it makes you kind of listen. Oh, maybe I, I know that name. Yeah, I know where it's from. It's, it's just like laying the groundwork for all the millions of Easter eggs that are coming our way in the rest of mm-hmm. the saga. Yeah, and it's even the Infinity Gauntlet as well. I know it's a passing thing that, you know, I only heard about it years and I went, everyone's like, oh, they're going to have to go to Asgard. I'm like, why? And so I was like, well, there's a shot where you can see the Gauntlet and then the Age of Ultron credit scene kind of retcon that and then Thor Ragnarok fully retconned it. And I even remember when they announced Ragnarok, everyone thought, oh my God, it's going to be Thanos destroying Asgard to take the Infinity Gauntlet and all this stuff. And it was like, no, 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 it was a very different film. Um but no, the Stanley cameo is it's, it's one of my favourite ones of him, especially sort of when I was talking about Iron Man 2 last time. It's like a half-second glimpse in awful non-GoPro, GoPro-styled camera. And this one is that really neat. You can tell that he would have been probably on set or nearby, and he's in the car. And it's it's just a nice, funny one. It, it suits what he's in there for. It's, it's nothing too dramatic. It's nothing overly comedic. It's like, okay, like because the surprise of the Stanley cameo is that it's meant to be a surprise. He's meant to just pop up. And that there he is, and him being the guy in the car as well, I, I think was was great for it. So I really like that one. Um, there's also, sorry, there's also a great moment um, from Frigga when um, I don't know if you might have said this when I dropped out, but where when um, Odin is about to announce Thor as king of Asgard, and he says, "As my firstborn," and Frigga gives a look. There's a look there, and it kind of almost implies that actually there is another one, but she's not here. And um, I don't know if that was implied or if it was planned out or whatever but it's a great moment oh no i don't I, I didn't catch that yeah i didn't think what i did clock which i don't know if it's also this is kind of similar is that one of the lines laufey says to i don't know if he says it's tom hiddleston or to, to thor he says um your father is a liar and a thief and i'm kind of there like well in in thor one it's like no he just sort of conquered your land then thor three like it's the sort of sort of really good post recently on social media about sort of the, the indigenous people the tribes sort of taking over and that represent that in Ragnarok when Hela's like Odin's covered our history. We were doing the pillaging, we were doing the thieving, we were doing this. And I wouldn't say it's intentional, but again, looking back as the years have gone by, like, oh, there's there's maybe something in that. And I like those kind of things, even if it's not intentional. It's like that kind of, you know, we, we've all studied film, the three of us. It's that when you're at school and they're like, what does this scene mean? I'm like, but it's just someone's hand. And they're like, but what does it mean? <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, that, it's that kind of thing. And I live for stuff like that. And I love the fact that Marvel's got big enough. Certainly it's got a bigger history than Star Wars. But what I've learned recently is that Star Wars was the only thing you would pause frame by frame. Now, I think more so of WandaVision, Marvel to me has reached that territory that it will be a frame by frame analysis of someone on Twitter later that day. And you will spot things that come up. And we're not going to spoil any WandaVision stuff in case, but we are seeing more of that. And, and I think the Thor film, certainly in Odin's vault, has all those kind of little Easter eggs and those sorts of things. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the one that 
I'm not going to go into it. We'll probably discuss it on a, well, this is pre-recorded, isn't it? But uh, we'll probably discuss <laughs> it at some point. George, you sent me a TikTok video of uh, like a theory that someone posed regarding WandaVision. And these people go in deep on these theories. This is a thing with Marvel now. And it's kind of making me go, now, did the people at Marvel, Kevin Feige, everyone around that, did are they just sort of going back and cleverly retconning things just on happenstance? Or are they actually setting this up five or six years ago and know where it's going to lead i think it's probably a bit of column a or column b probably now they have a plan back then who knows maybe they were sort of like hedging their bets and seeing how avengers would go over uh, i'm gonna see how much money this film made actually uh, i did make a, a decent amount so it was done on a budget of 150 mil made um about 450 mil so uh, especially around that time as well that's a, sort of like a modest amount that it made so that was good um, I'm trying to think of what else we could talk about this one. Should we talk um, about the soundtrack? I was going to say, I know you want to talk about the soundtrack and we've not got to yet. So, <laughs> yeah, go for it. This is something that I've I've not really thought of much until me and you were chatting recently. Then you were sort of like, the soundtrack is this. And yeah, I'm going to hand over to you. Patrick Doyle's soundtrack to this film is easily, next to Sylvester's, the best MCU soundtrack, in my opinion. Uh, and I think it's absolutely criminal that they didn't use any of the main themes or motifs that were made in this film in any of the future Thor films. I think the main theme from this film comes back very, very briefly at the end of Ragnarok. But um, Ragnarok had like had its own soundtrack. It was like a very 80s synthy soundtrack and it didn't sound anything like what Patrick Doyle would, did with this film to the point where when the main Thor film theme came back in at the end of that film it almost gave me like tonal whiplash like oh we're going back to the, <laughs> the original soundtrack um and i do love the soundtrack to thor the dark world as well but it used none of the same themes from this one um thor gets a theme in this which i think is such a shame that they never carried that on that's sort of like one of my biggest criticisms of the marvel films overall is that you never really had any kind of musical themes carrying over maybe with the exception of captain america and the main main avengers theme there's no sort of identifiable theme you can attach to any of these characters and i feel like we got that identifiable theme with this one but sadly because it never got used therefore it's not really identifiable it's just sort of another random soundtrack that's thrown in there but uh this is one of the few marvel films where i will gladly like listen to this soundtrack in isolation um it's it's fantastic it hits all the emotional beats um thor's theme's great and it you know you can play it triumphantly or it can be played in a completely different way where it's somber and emotional um and especially when it hits that ending where the music builds and then you hit that credits and you've got like the camera whizzing through the galaxy it's fantastic it always gives me like the highest highs when i get to the end of this film so very underrated score patrick doyle score to this film um and it's yeah as i keep mentioning it's a shame they didn't really utilize it more or continue it forwards yeah, I would have liked to have seen some um, soundtrack the score themes throughout uh, the Avengers films in general. I mean, I, I absolutely love Cap's theme. I love when that comes in, when Tony hands in the shield in Endgame. I think it's such a beautiful moment, and it's a moment that is built because of the music. And it is a shame that Thor didn't get that. I think, uh, yeah, his character deserved it. But that being said, I haven't really listened to the score's much on their own other than Endgame. It's one of my favorite film scores of all time. But since doing so, since becoming familiar with Endgame, I have picked up some of the older ones and I really do love this one. It, it Like you say, it just stands out. It stands out above the rest of them. I can be listening to the nine hour MCU playlist I've got on shuffle and a, a, tr a track from Thor will come out and I'll just know instantly that it's, it's, the, it's the Thor score. So yeah, it's definitely one of, it's up there. It's up there with one of the best. Yeah, this is a weird one for me because I'd never, not never like listened to it because I'm not going to lie, I still actually haven't. I should have done it in prep for today. Um, <laughs> watching the film, knowing what Chris has said to me online in the past, I was like, I'm going to really start. And you get that when you mentioned that when he walks down, when it's the sort of ceremony, you get the triumph and stuff. But again, it's that Lord of the Rings comparison that when they're going through the history, it's when you get soundtracks that work. So I'm not saying it blends into the background, but when you've got a definitive voiceover, you're thinking of that. But really, there's a great soundtrack behind it, also telling the story with you. And I think this film has the best original score, certainly of the Thor films. And even what we've kind of spoke of the Avengers, that I was watching a, a later MCU film last night. And I, I was like, oh my God, this theme was used in Endgame. And I'm not going to, it's not hard to guess what film that was, but it was kind of there. Like, Chris, you're right, that why don't any of these Thor films get used again? Even in Thor 2 they kind of have the origin soundtrack for the main MCU theme. And then Chikina came in and 
did it properly um, down the line. And <laughs> it's it's one of those really weird soundtracks where I kind of want to go back to it. And it's a shame they've forgotten it. I feel it because there's been X, Y, Z films since then, they didn't want to go back to it because no one else has. And if they went back to it now, it'd be like, well, where has it been for 10 years? And I think it's a massive shame when you get certainly franchises that do that with the soundtracks that it's, you, you're lacking the consistency. And not not to bring in the slider cut, um, you know when you when you when you think about the Justice League and you've got that, you know ah here's the Danny Elfman Batman theme in yeah. a not Michael Keaton Batman film and you're kind of there like well I get that's your character but why don't you do the honourable thing like Hans Zimmer and say I'm I can't do this version of this character I'm just gonna bring in someone else to do it for me and it it feels there's a bit of sort of composer syndrome where I don't know if they're trying to up one another but oh, well, I didn't make four soundtracks, so I'm not going to carry on with what they did last time. And I don't like films that do that. I know just takes a weird example, but you see it very consistently and very few composers come on board and actually take inspiration or follow up stuff properly. And it's a shame of Thor because I think they could have built upon that, certainly the first two films. And I think when you get to Ragnarok, you know, you think of the Grandmaster Jam and it's very, very techno and stuff like that. It's, it's a completely different soundtrack too, but... Maybe we'll get something different, Love and Thunder. I, I doubt it, but again, it feels like a fantasy epic and you've got the score to match it. Yeah, and I think you mentioned consistency there with the score, but I also think that the, the, the Avengers film that followed this and the other Thor films I've mentioned, you know, the change of tone and consistency, it, it doesn't really feel in keeping with this first film. Even central plot points where this film finishes, even the post credit scene doesn't really make sense in continuity of what we get so um at the end um the bifrost is destroyed and there's this really nice moment with father and son where you know he says that you know he, he wishes he could get back to natalie portman oh no it's heimdall isn't it he, he goes and sees heimdall at the bifrost who's standing guard and he says like what can you see and he says like she searches for you but he can't get back to her because he's destroyed the bifrost well conveniently then when we get to avengers thor just shows up out of nowhere and there's like an offhanded line saying how much dark, dark magic did the, you know, yeah the secrets only the sith knew um how much dark magic did odin have to summon to get you back here and that's it and it's explained and you know it's fine because it's the avengers and we want to see them all together and we want to see them punch aliens in the face and, and we get that but it's you know following on from where this teed up at the end it it feels like kind of a retcon and very easy even the post credit scene the post credit scene in this one is where scars guard you never know where it, whether it's Loki in disguise because you see the reflection and it's Loki in the mirror. So is he sort of in the the guise of Skarsgård or is he possessed Skarsgård? Well, that doesn't actually happen until into the Avengers film. So it, it doesn't follow up on a few of those things. But I think the biggest one for me was that longing to get back with Natalie Portman, whether you think it was earned or not. Probably not because, as you mentioned, they only know each other for about 10, you know, 10 hours. <laughs> But it was a nice moment at the end. It was a nice emotional beat where you could go, oh, where's the sequel going to lead? But obviously you've got Avengers stuck in between and you need to get Thor back to Earth. So that was kind of a bit of a shame, I thought, how they handled that. Yeah, and I think Heimdall's an interesting character in this one. Uh, mo probably because of how, what I know they're going to do with the character in the future films. But like in, in Infinity War, he talk Thor talks about how his best friend has just died. And it's like in the first Thor film, I mean, he's almost just like a colleague. You know, like that, that yeah. wouldn't really go as far as to say they're best friends. I wouldn't have even known Heimdall's name in the first film. So mm -hmm. I, I think he's uh, I think he's an interesting character. And I think, yeah, like you say, Idris Elba got a profile. So they were probably like, well, he's already in our film. So what can we do with him? Um, Probably doesn't help that I'm not a huge Idris Elba fan anyway, so maybe that has something to do with it. But I just think he's a bit of a weird character, like an important character. But I much prefer, and you're probably going to both disagree with me, but I much prefer Carl Urban in that role. Not obviously a different character, but same job. I love him in Ragnarok. I think he's a brilliant addition to the cast. I think he brings in so much more character than Heimdall has. I mean, who is he? He doesn't even do anything. Anyway. If, I if, won't talk uh, about no, Ragnarok because I feel like I'm going to like... <laughs> if Idris Elba no, had I... a shaved weight, would you prefer him in this film? Say that again? If Idris Elba had a shake weight in this film, would you prefer him? <laughs> I'm... I don't know. <laughs> I'm I'm sort of leaning towards Charlie here because uh, Carl Urban is extraordinary in Ragnarok and now we've seen the boys, they're probably devastated they killed him off in Ragnarok that we can't get him back in the fourth Marvel <laughs> yeah. film, but 
if they you know with marvel does it's chris have we said many times you know if you see them die on screen it still doesn't mean they're dead now that's the level we've, nothing. It, used to be, it used to be if they've got an off-screen death they'll come back now it's like we literally see them die twice three times four and they'll still pop up and we'll find out what yep. happens the fifth one so yeah no there there is that and um, kind of wrapping up the ending and that's what i kind of like and dislike is that we know he's got to come back in the images. This is the first film, I think, where they do the whole James Bond credits thing where it's like Thor will return in the Avengers. Mm-hmm. And it's like, yeah, we, we kind of know it just gets the credit scene. And, you know, it's one that doesn't get a payoff. Now, this is what I should have really researched, but I don't know if Whedon directed the credit scene or was it something that, you know, um, what's his name? Kenneth Branagh did because in the Iron Man 2 credit scene, I think Favreau and Kenneth Branagh were talking with one another so they could do it together. So I think the, the stylistic look of Thor was obviously different to Iron Man, and I think John Favreau wanted to get the blend of both, whereas it it looks like it's a Joss Whedon thing in Thor credits, and then Chris Uther, there's, there's no payoff. It's not involved. It's, it's nothing to do with the Thor ending, and it, it's just a very strange flex that doesn't even have a payoff, and I don't think the credit scene is good, not because it's not followed up, but if, you, if the Avengers film had started with Loki's already controlling Eric Selvig, it would have been a bit strange. Whereas I like the way the Avengers does it, where he sort of takes them one by one with the scepter and it makes a bit more sense in a, in a filmic sense. But it is a very strange credit scene. And but it, it as a credit scene, it doesn't just tease the Avengers. It's they're showing the Tesseract for the first time, which obviously has a massive role in Captain America, which will be our, which will be our next discussion. Um, not sure if anyone else has got anything to say about the credit scene or if anyone wants to go over some of their favourite scenes really quickly. Um, favorite scenes for me. Um, I think I've mentioned most of them. I love the one where Thor tries to lift the hammer in the rain and he can't do it, and just sort of how defeated he is and the soundtrack behind that part. I love the part where Loki appears in a vision to him and he, you know, he lies to him and tells him that his father's dead. I love how Hemsworth plays that and he says, like, thank you for coming here and seeing me. I, I think they played that brilliantly. Um, oh god, other scenes. The bit where he becomes <laughs> Thor finally and destroys the destroyer and you get the the tornado and the music. Again, the music, the theme kicks in. It's like you feel it. You feel that moment. And um, just as a set piece, I love the rainbow bridge. Like trying to make that work off the page where there is a literal rainbow that people ride over. That works in a comic book, but I, I love the visual design of how they did that. And it's almost like this fiber optic strobe effect on the bridge. Um, so just like conceptually, everything with Asgard. I just love all this film. All the stuff on Asgard, it's fantastic. The <laughs> stuff on Earth, eh, it doesn't destroy my love of the film, but it is what it is. Um, it's obvious which my favourite scene is. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. Any moment that Clint Barton is on screen is my favourite scene. I needed that purple <laughs> costume, though. I needed the purple costume. I think it's, it's like, like, Loki it's can Wolverine. have the helmet. It's the Wolverine effect, isn't it? <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, mm. he would have looked stupid. Let's let's be honest. If Wolverine had rocked up on set of X Men wearing a yellow and blue lycra suit, everyone would have gone. <laughs> I'd have been fine with serious. it. <laughs> <laughs> Hawkeye turned up with a great big purple mask, <laughs> and oh, I mean, it would it no, it would just wouldn't have worked. <laughs> oh God, favorite scene, Chris. Probably the best one is the lifting the hammer. I think we get the build up. We see him fighting without the weapon. Another great scene is the fight with the Frost Giants. It's the fancy epic when you've got mm-hmm. that weird giant dog dragon thing and he just flies into it 100 miles per hour. It's amazing seeing Yolnir before. I'm not saying it's become a trope, not at all. But again, how do you introduce the weapon, which is almost as great as the character? It's almost like Captain America Shield. You need to you need to absolutely nail how you do that. And I think they, they deliver with this. But to me, my favorite scene is probably... Anthony Hopkins. When I, the dressing down of thought, Chris, you made that noise that he did. I th- can't remember. I was, I was sending that to you as a meme yesterday. I don't know if it's sent. I'll actually have to check my phone later on to see if that went through. But um, any anything of Anthony Hopkins just talking or acting with your actors is, is stands out, and it it just makes this sort of so much bigger than some not bigger than some of the other films, but in terms of that acting, the profession, and you know that sort of snobbery. This is film, all that kind of stuff. People do getting actual scenes you know, of, of great dialogue, family feuds, character development, all in the deliveries of the actors not being seen with C. Jones, stuff like that. Uh, I think it's phenomenal on that effect. And that's why sort of low-key, it's very underrated, I think. I think, again, a lot of the Phase 1 films, I think people just glimpse over, pass by, because it wasn't the Avengers yet, and things weren't as consistent as they are now. And th- there's a lot to take in go- revisiting. I think that's the kind of point of this, that going back to Thor is made me not question Ragnarok, but it is that kind of 
what could have been, no matter how much I love what's come after, what could have been if things followed in that trajectory. And I think the the, the Dark World had thoroughly destroyed that, um, which will be fun to get to next week. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. We didn't mention the Dutch angles, just really quickly. There's so oh. many of them in this film. I don't know if that's <laughs> a choice by Kenneth Branagh. I don't know what that is. I haven't seen many Kenneth Branagh films. I think he directed Murder on the Orient Express, didn't he? The remake of that, which I really enjoyed. Don't remember any Dutch angles in there. So maybe this was him experimenting with this film and then quickly gave it up afterwards. I don't know. But it makes you feel like you're on a ship that's sinking and like all the actors are just going to slide in the frame <laughs> down to the corner. Uh, yeah, that's the last thing I can say on the film. Um, I, I love it. It's one of my favourite MCU films. It was really great going back to this one. Yeah, thoroughly enjoyed my rewatch of it. Um, uh, and I'm also really glad I don't have to watch Dark World like you might have to. <laughs> it's just not something I ever really feel the need to go back to. I I'd rather keep my scared. memories of... Yeah, oh, well, I would be. I, I would also <laughs> be scared to watch it again. I like my memories of Thor to be Thor, the original Thor. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a great film. Very, very watchable. I say I'm scared because we ha I don't think we've announced who's going to be on Dark World yet. So maybe I'm going to have to draw the short straw on that one and <laughs> bite the bullet and, and watch it again. I think I'm busy um, that night. <laughs> yeah, I'm. I'm just kind of sat here like, oh, I've got one person, but not a second person. <laughs> And uh, maybe my uh, some off-stream antics of getting people in has been difficult. That being said, I'm not here for the dark world. Very fortunately, I think it's the better way of ending that <laughs> sentence. Um, but I want to know everyone's thoughts at home about the very first Thor film. Well, actually, no. Do comment about the trilogy, because it's one of the weirdest trilogies, the least consistent trilogy inside the, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, inside the three phases, which is insane. And, of course, Thor is the only character to get an individual fourth film which is going to be new territory for all of us in 2022. So that's going to be interesting. But we want everyone to comment below with your thoughts on this film. If you do like the video, if you like the series, then be sure to share it and do subscribe. We've got videos coming out every Monday, Wednesday, and Saturday for this series. It's been an absolute blast having you back on, Chris, and bringing on for the first time, Charlie. The next Marvel video is going to be Captain America, the first Avenger. Chris will be joining me on that one. He's uh, been helping out big time in phase one. I'm very excited to go back to that probably because it is the most recent Marvel film I've watched, which was a very interesting double bill. Aside from that, we've got a lot of stuff happening on the channel. We've got our retro reviews, which are going to be carrying on every Tuesday. At the time of this video coming out, One Division is finished, so do check out our One Division finale. But that also means that next week we have the Falcon and the Winter Soldier starting up, which is may maybe not because of One Division, was probably the most anticipated Marvel series, maybe not anymore. So if you do like the Marvel stuff, stick around for that. And we also have the Cinema Savvy Awards coming out every Thursday at 8 p.m. Now, what's also going to be a big one is, of course, the schedule for this. I've mixed that one up. Oh, well. Um, so we've got three more videos a week. As I said, we've got Avengers coming after Captain America. Then we're moving on to Phase 2. Everyone's scared of it. Thor The Dark World will be coming to Iron Man 3. The real question is, will there be more than two people on that video? That's something <laughs> we need to figure out. And for you guys to find out at home of intrigue, or if there is a Thor The Dark World fan, do comment below and let us know you're going to be in that video. Not in the video, but comment below on that video because we know I'll be thoroughly disappointed if there are loads of people saying that's the one I'm the most looking forward to. I was going to say, you really see, like, one dislike on this video is going to be from that one Dark World fan. It's Christopher Eccleston. This is why, why are you giving me to Malekith the Accursed? What did Malekith do wrong to you? But, um, no, that is everything we can do. We'll go over the socials once more for you all at home. So, best way to find us is on Facebook at Cinema Savvy, Twitter at Cinema underscore Savvy, letterbox.com slash Cinema Savvy, and T Public link is in the description below. And if you want to find Charlie, we have her Twitter handle here, which is Funny Old World. And Charlie, do you want to talk about some of the blogs you do and the websites you write on as well? Um. Yeah, I write for uh, the film magazine. I used to cover their box office, but obviously don't do that at the moment. So I've been doing reviews and uh, opinion pieces on there and then just uh, my own reviews as well on my website. So you can just find me on Twitter. So do check that. We'll have a link in the description below. And once again, thank you for everyone watching at home and we'll be sure to see you on the next one. Thanks. <laughs>